Okay, recording on this computer, we are on 250, real ear, and we think we are finishing unit six, and we will move into unit seven, okay? And for any of you wondering about questions four and five on that darned quiz six, don't freak about it. If you can't pull those questions up, as Lynn Royer was trying to instruct us, how she did it. Don't worry about it. I'll grade the ding dong quiz out of eight instead of 10. Who cares? Okay. Main point is that we basically get it. All right. So buttons and become a tailor. What I think I'm going to do here is share screen and we'll look at unit um, six at the very end of unit six. So we'll go to here today's real year and we'll pull up where I left off last time. I believe that was slide 59. So here we go. If you're comparing the fitting methods, and we'll make this large so we can compare the fitting methods, and you're looking at DSL versus NAL on, an, on a real ear system, and this is kind of where we finished last week, okay? You're looking at a sloping hearing loss here. And now you're looking at DSL-5 for an adult. And you can see the hearing loss plotted upward now because it's in DBSPL. You'll see normal hearing at 0 dBHL, also known as MAP, minimal audible pressure on the bottom. You'll see the asterisks at the top, frequency specific loudness tolerance levels. And so now you can really get a great display of the floor, versus the ceiling. And that's the big advantage of today's real ear, is it's better for counseling. It makes more sense. When you're looking at old real ear with R-E-A-R and R-E-U-R on the bottom, and then you'll see you know, a target and you'll see your real ear insertion gain, that does not explain basically what's happening in terms of speech. I mean, it's very hard for a person to understand what's happening in terms of hearing speech. And I wonder if I even have a picture of that here. Yeah, look at this. I mean, honest to Pete, looking at this doesn't tell you anything. And always remember, there's two things that are wrong with this, okay? One is, R-E-U-R wasn't used in your hearing test because your head, you had your he ear was plugged with a headphone. As soon as you plug your ear with a headphone, you've destroyed the outer ear canal quarter wave resonator. It's no longer a quarter wave resonator. You've closed off the cup at both ends. So if you didn't use your R-E-U-R during your hearing test, why are you using it during your hearing aid test? Okay? That's one of the big objections that Richard Seewald had with R-E-U-R. It just doesn't make any sense. If you, were, if you did your hearing test in a sound field where you listened in front of a speaker, well, then you are using your RERs, then, then, then okay, go for it. But no one tests hearing in a sound field anymore. So this picture is also critically wrong for its poor counseling abilities. And it, you just, it does not talk in English or convey with any clarity whatsoever what's going on in an, it, with the hearing aids in the ear. So back to where we were here, good old this slide right here. So you're looking at a hearing loss, and you're looking at now what's happening in terms of what should be happening. Unaided speech is the green, the mean is the, the, is the line, and the range is the top to the bottom. And in general, the mean is not in the center of the range, and we know that's because speech is a very staccato, stop-start type of situation. And here's targets for DSL-5. Now notice these targets in the highs barely are above the thresholds. DSL isn't too concerned about that because if you're looking at this big fat green here, if the mean is lifted here, lots of it will be audible above. Okay, so look at this whole area where my cursor is. If I'm bringing up the mean so it's touching these plus signs, then lots of it is still within the listener's dynamic range. At any rate, now one. DSL-5. Now one. Look what it does. It rolls off highs. So now one really tends to act more like a bubble. It adds more in the mids 
and it ta and it gives less in the very highs and sometimes in the lows. This person doesn't have much hearing loss in the lows, so the targets are identical at 250 hertz. There's no difference. Okay. If I go to NAL2 versus NAL1, NAL2, notice the target extends all the way out to 6,000 hertz, whereas NAL1 doesn't. That's one thing that distinguishes NAL2 from NAL1. Second of all, NAL2 drops its requirements in the mids compared to NAL1, NAL2. Weird, huh? So this is... Now two is more like DSL-5. So if you're comparing DSL-5, now two. DSL-5, now two. And you've got two different targets here, of course. The purple or pink is the soft input targets. And the green is, of course, the, the outputs that you'd want for average inputs. So you're getting two different inputs here. If you look on the bottom right, you'll see the input of uh, 65 and 55, okay? Soft being 55, average being 65, but look at how close the two darn things are. So let's just kind of take this to a close here, and let's look, is this a great fit for an average input of 65 dB SPL? I'll ask you, what do you think? You got unaided speech here, you have aided here, what do you see that you like or dislike? What do you think in, in this particular picture? It looks a little high to me. Yeah, high. you're right. It is. Uh, but the it other is. look okay. So yep. it's an okay fit, but I wouldn't prefer it. It's a bit much. Yeah. Because look where you're putting the outputs for average speech input. You're, you're putting it in the center of the dynamic range. And that's what DSL-4 used to do. DSL-4 was that power-hungry fitting method. So if we look at the DSL-4 targets here, and we'll just go up and take a look. Here's a DSL-4 fitting. Look where the plus signs are, right in the middle. And that's a bit much, okay? DSL-5 backed off. Now never did ask or offer as much, but DSL-4 had to be taught a lesson, and so Seawald put it to death and killed it as you saw in that stuffed mannequin picture that he had. So basically, let's just kind of take this whole thing home here. And we looked at that. Look at this now. Okay, for what speech input might this be a good fit? So you're looking here. And now you'll see this is the green is sitting here. For what speech input might you think this is a good fit? For soft Average or loud? Soft. Good. Yeah. Just look at where the green is. It's all hugging the thresholds. The mean is barely above the thresholds. Barely. So that's what you want for soft inputs. Your targets, you want them to be kind of, eh. Because if soft speech is barely audible to someone with normal hearing, why should that be the case any different for someone with hearing loss? You want to aid soft speech so it's barely audible. So you can visually see what the client is hearing. And I think that's such the, the huge benefit of doing real ear. And clinicians out there that aren't doing it, which is 60% of people out there aren't using real ear. Okay, mm -hmm. They're just going blind. They are fitting according to manufacturer software that they see on their screen, and they're believing it. And there's nothing wrong with having faith, but come on, there's a bit of, uh, you gotta, all too often when you verify with real ear, it's not doing what the software said. And always forgive the manufacturers because it's not their job to do the fitting. Their job is to get you in the ballpark. Our job is to complete the job. And you complete the job by doing real ear. For what speech input might this be a good fit? So when you're looking at this one now, you've got the, you've got the uh, mean here saved from, for soft inputs. So this is the output you wanted for soft input speech. Now you did a second run. And so you can see the mean for soft input speech is left here. And now you can see that this is, how far is the mean above the thresholds here? 
So it's for average, it's less than half. Yeah, it's less than half. You're around a third. And that might be a decent fitting for average speech inputs. This is basically what all hearing aid fitting formulas are doing. Whether it's DSL-5, NAL-1, or NAL-2, they're all slightly different from each other, but basically they're all doing a similar thing. Okay? Now, does this look like a complete fitting? Why or why not? So what happened with the light blue? You kept what you had for soft inputs. You stored what you what your output for average inputs. This is the output for loud inputs. And it's all below UCLs or all below the asterisks with the exception of right here. There's a little peekaboo sticking his head out through the clouds. But other than that, you have now measured the output for three different inputs. And they used to have a commercial for Crest toothpaste. Fighting cavities is the whole idea behind Crest. Well, guess what? Three inputs is the whole idea behind a real ear fitting. You do an, you measure an out, you measure the outputs for three different inputs: soft, average, and loud. With soft being 55, average being 65, and loud being around 80. Okay, so you've got those three different inputs, and now you've spread the outputs all across the listener's dynamic range. So you can see you have mapped speech. This is speech mapping. That's what they mean by that term, regardless of the, of the real ear equipment that's being used to do it. Okay, it was audio scan that coined the term speech mapping. Seawall didn't call it that. He called it SPLogram. This, this is the SPLogram. From his SPLogram grew, um, see, he, he was at a university, Western Ontario University, and AudioScan is in the same city, London, Ontario, Canada. It's a city of about 300,000 people, about twice the size of Springfield, way smaller than Portland, okay, way smaller than Vancouver, where I am. So tiny, tiny, but it's a, a mid-sized city, and both the real ear company and the university were housed in the same place, so they really communicated a lot with each other. And so AudioScan borrowed DSL-4, and they put it on their real ear equipment. And then later on, NAL got put on that real ear equipment, and then DSL-5 evolved, and then NAL-1 evolved into NAL-2, and so they, but it all kind of grew together. So Seawald really was the one who changed real ear from insertion gain, R-E-U-R, R-E-A-R, R-E-I-G, changed it to the SPLogram, audio scan took it and said, let's call it speech mapping. And now everybody's calling it that. Hey, man, everyone's doing it. So cool. All right. So this essentially kind of sums up where we are regarding today's real ear. Whoops, what is that, Zoom group chat? Not really, I don't know. Okay, let's share a screen here and figure out where we are at the end of this PowerPoint. Here we go. Here's another real ear system called the Oracle. And I think uh, uh, OTC has an Oracle system. And you can look at this, you can see, once again, the dynamic range here. Here's MAP, okay, normal hearing, and here's the here here's the loudness tolerance levels on the top. You can see the speech banana where you'd want speech to be. Look at how it's in the lower third. So this is for someone with normal hearing. This guy's got completely normal hearing. There's no hearing loss. Okay. But if you look at the right, and you look at the right hand slide, you can see how the whole floor went up. And if I was to throw this on a test or a quiz or an exam. And I was to say, I was to ask you, how much hearing loss does this person have on the right? When you look at this, so look at this floor is elevated. Normal hearing is on the bottom here. This is MAP, 0 dBHL. What do you think this hearing loss would look like on an audiogram? I'll get my glasses on so I can see it too. If this 200 here is 125 hertz, it's right here at 25, isn't it? So where's this guy's hearing loss? 75. 75 minus 25 is 
50. So let's look at 1,000 hertz. You're right here. You're at about 8. Okay? And where is he here? About 68. Okay? What's the hearing loss here? Oh, no, you're not. 58. You're at 58. 58. No, yeah, minus 8. 50, once again. Look at 2,000 hertz. I'm here at about 12. And now that's normal hearing. Let's go to the hearing loss. I'm about 62. 62 minus 12 is 50. So what do you think this guy's hearing loss would look like on an audiogram? Flat. The flat 50 dB loss. Okay? It's that kind of stuff that well, I like to people to kind of be able to see what's, what's happening. You're, you're transitioning from HL into SPL. So you now this is an SPLogram. And basically, if this curve at the bottom is 0 dB HL or MAP in dB SPL, then a flat loss on an audiogram is actually going to look like a mirror image of the MAP. It's just going to be 50 dB higher. Okay? Essentially. All right. What's going on here? If you took a look here at this picture. <laughs> Yeehaw! So the, well, there's no target. We have the here. You have no target. No, you don't have a target. You're right. Target is not there. But what else do you see about the, uh, the, the, the uh, speech and the thresholds? Can't hear anything? Yeah, he can't. The guy's not hearing any. All, all of the speech is below his hearing thresholds. It's not audible. Every stinking piece of it, the whole, the whole green belt here is below his hearing thresholds. It's inaudible. Okay, here again. For what speech input might this be a good fit? Here you go. Soft. Soft, yep. Because the speech is barely audible. It's, some of it's audible. You can hear pieces of it. You can tell the purple or pink is surrounding the thresholds. But if it was average inputs, I mean, you'd want this. Okay, even this is maybe a bit much, but if you're at least about, you're about a third above the thresholds. So again, you've turned, if this is for soft, this might be what you'd want for average. And of course, loud, you wouldn't want it much. You'd want maybe a little bit higher. Okay. So basically, today it's DSL-5 or NAL-2, and your speech stimulus is usually 65 dB SPL. And we should make sure to call this just like 55 dB HL. What's an average MCL for someone with normal hearing? And why don't we just kind of, there you go, we'll say the four words men usually hate hearing the most. We need to talk. <laughs> what would you say, what's an average MCL? An average MC, most comfortable loudness level in speech. If the guy has perfectly normal hearing, and his hearing is at 0 dB HL across the frequencies. An average MCL is about 50 to 60. An average UCL is about 100. You know, pure tone average is going to be 0. So his speech reception threshold is going to be 0. And his MCL is going to be around 50 to 60. What's the middle between 50 and 60? 55. So if we stop share, if we start sharing screen again and having a look here, average speech stimulus input, 65 dB SPL, which is about 55 dB HL. And you try to keep a little bit above the thresholds so that some of it's still audible, okay? And then speech stimulus soft is going to be 55 SPL. And that's going to be probably like about 40 or 45 dB HL. So it's very important to tie together what as a normal MCL and tie that together with why the, why the average speech is 65. If an average MCL is between 50 or 60, and between 50 or 60 is 55, that's HL. In terms of dB SPL, that's about 65. A loud stimulus, if you use pure tones, do, 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 do. Some, some systems just use pure tones. Do, 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 do. 
then you can afford to make it 85. If it's speech, I would keep it around 80. 80-ish. 75, some people do. 80, I do. And you want to make sure that your outputs are below the asterisks or below loudness discomfort levels. Some people also use live voice of a spouse or loved one. That's not a bad idea. It makes things kind of homey. But the problem is it's not calibrated. So it's not a bad thing to do if you want to really draw in the spouse and make the whole connections. You can have he or she talk at the husband wearing the hearing aids and unaided and watch the outputs fall below the thresholds and then aided talk at a normal loudness level and watch the thresholds fall or watch the outputs go above the thresholds. It's not a bad idea. It's kind of fun, actually. And I would actually encourage people to do that because it actually draws in the client and it makes the, the, you know, the whole process a union of the relationship because hearing loss involves connections. So I think it's kind of a neat idea to do, but the problem with it is the speech from the spouse isn't exactly the same. It's not that rainbow passage or what they have on other real ear systems. May I ask you, Megan, are you using real ear in Portland or over there? What, is your supervisor, are you seeing a supervisor out there at all that, that, that you're in clinic? Yes. Yeah, so um, I just finished my training and he used uh, speech mapping. Yeah, he used mm -hmm. real ear. Yeah, I'm just curious. Do you know what kind of system he used? Or like what the name of the equipment was? He used MedRx. Yeah, MedRx. That's a popular one. Yeah, that's a good system. It's kind of it very colorful. Yes, it is very colorful. <laughs> well, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah oh, I find the Oracle not bad, but it's hard to use. The Oracle is this weird one that you kind of hang around the guys. It looks like a, looks really weird. It's just hanging thing around it looks like you're putting on a space suit or something it's uh and it's all windows yeah. based so it's all you always get these three messages do you want to keep this audiogram do you want to cancel and use a read-only copy and it's like well, i don't know <laughs> Just, i always get confused by those questions because it's really really heavily computer based but uh anyway i think yeah. we are very at the very end of that particular unit where are we here Ah, yeah, there's the last slide. Look at this. I'll get rid of this black thing that hangs up here. It always drives me nuts. I wish that were there. Thank you. I wrote an article a few years ago, fitting methods. Are they becoming islands in the setting sun? And you have to wonder sometimes because look what you're doing with real ear, like what we just did in the last five or six slides. Where I was asking, is this a good fitting? Is that a, what would you do here? What would you do here? Really, when you're looking at NAL1, NAL2, DSL5, how different are they really from each other? Not much. A man on a flying horse would be hard-pressed to notice the difference. So if that's the case, and if you can see what it is that you're doing, and if I should say if you can see what the client's hearing, and you've done speech mapping with soft inputs, average inputs, loud inputs, and you've mapped those outputs onto the guy's residual dynamic range, aren't you doing exactly what the fitting method sought out to do in the first place? And if that's what you're doing, in some ways, you can forget using fitting methods. Oh, blasphemy. But you can. If you're fitting so that the outputs for soft inputs are hugging the thresholds and the outputs for average inputs are about a third above the thresholds and the outputs for loud inputs never exceed the asterisks, you're done. Like an old salmon, you can swim up the stream to die. You have spawned and given that you have, you've done your, your, your thing. Because that's what Liebarger was trying to do 60 years ago with functional gain. So when we take it to there, and really this is a trip and a half, if you take it to where he was and you go up here to good old functional gain, have a look at this puppy. Because that's, he didn't have real ear. So all he did measured the guy under headphones, got the thresholds, 
then sat him in front of a speaker, one meter distance, with a hearing aid in his ear, turned up to a comfortable volume, about halfway, and then, hey, look, the aided thresholds, if I make them about halfway above where they were, then that means for inputs like average speech, the outputs will sit here. Hey. You're doing with today's real ear, it's actually this picture flipped upside down. That's, that's all it is. You, you've just taken what Liebarger did and you're, you're flipping it right side up. So now your speech a a outputs are sitting up here and the thresholds are rising from the bottom. Essentially, but Liebarger didn't have real ear, so he couldn't see that. All he could do is have faith hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. So all he thought to himself was self, if I increase the thresholds by half, that means that when average speech comes into the hearing aid, instead of testing the thresholds, like soft, soft sounds coming out of a, a speaker so the guy's raising his hands, if I can improve his thresholds by half, that means I've got half gain. And if I add half of the hearing loss, if I add the hearing loss, half of it, to input speech, and if input speech in DBHL is 55, and I add 25 to 55, look where my outputs are, around 85, 90. Perfect. So, so that's how all fitting methods sought to imitate this. And then we had kind of a, an odd transition to this early real ear, but this was cool because it was quick. And the fitting methods didn't change. Remember, the fitting methods did not change. Okay? Just the method of measurement changed. So the target in red is identical to the letter A's here. I made sure I did that on Poipus. Now they measure they were big time into REUR, and that's where we discovered the resonance of the outer ear, was when we did real ear measurements in the late 1980s. That's when people figured out the outer ear canal resonance, because they were snaking a tube in there and measuring the resonance of the outer ear canal. So the REUR was a huge focus. And then later on, we switched to the sp -Ligram because you had a heck of a lot better counseling tool. And that's basically where we are today. So we've kind of come full circle. Now, we still use now, of course, and people still use DSL, but all I'm doing is theoretically saying to you that basically the wishes of those fitting methods are quite similar, the mapping of speech into the listener's dynamic range. So if I shut this one down and we'll close that little quiz and we'll look at what else we should look at in Unit 7. There is an article. If you go into your Unit 7, you will see, I'm going to show you this here. If I go up and look in good old 250 for 2018, I'll pull this away. You can see my screen. Look at Unit 7. There's three parts to it. Notes the PowerPoint, and an article. Now, the article is very important to take a read of. This is a good article. It was written in 2015. And what it's talking about, and I'll show it to you here. I'll collapse this. The article is manufacturers now two fittings fail real ear verification. And it shows that what Every manufacturer that uses NAL2, they have to pay money. They have to buy it. They have to buy it to use it as a patent because it's patented. But they all incorporate NAL2 differently. They all do. It's nuts. And I'm gonna, this, this article is a very important article. Gus Mueller is a renowned uh, audiologist in our field. And you'll probably hear him speak at a... At a at a who, who knows, he's spoken at good old uh, tri-state conferences in Portland. I've spoken with him at conferences. Gus Mueller is a big name in the field. And he wrote an article with several other researchers. And basically, the article describes 
what's going on with how people are using NAL2. All the different manufacturers are using NAL2 differently. In other words, if you really want to get an untainted NAL2, you have to find it on real ear systems because they are impartial. Manufacturers use it. So I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to blow up these pictures here because I have them in a PowerPoint in good old Unit 7. And we'll just take a look at some of that. Have a look over here just for fun. I'm going to show you what that article is talking about. So here's a picture. And when you read the picture, what does it say? Article by these people, 2015, manufacturers now two fittings fail real ear verification. Figure 1A, results for the manufacturer's proprietary fittings for male speech passage of audio scan verifit at 55 dB, so soft speech, average for 16 ears. Now two target is shown as a reference. Okay, that's the thick line in red. So it's for some fictitious hearing loss, okay? You got a now two target. And look at, see, they're just showing you right here. And look at the manufacturer's proprietary fitting methods, their own. They're like Siemens will have its own fitting method and Oticon will have its own fitting method. They'll buy now two, they'll use now one, they'll use DSL five, but they'll also have their own. And that's called a proprietary fitting method. Look at how they compare. Notice how they roll off the highs. The targets are all below now, especially for the highs. And then when you look at 65 dB SPL inputs, so average inputs, now they're closer to now. They look pretty good. They all look fairly close to what the now target is. And when you look at what they want for 75, Look at this. They ask for more than now. Isn't that weird? So proprietary fitting methods are almost acting like the hearing aids linear. They're giving almost the same amount of gain for soft, average, and loud, whereas compression gives less and less and less gain for as the inputs go up, up, up. But so this is for 75 dB SPL inputs. The outputs are here more than now, too. For 65, they're like now to, and for 55, they're less than now to, especially at the highs. Those are the proprietary fitting methods. But now look at what happens how they use now to. Let's look at now to. Average difference values. Look at this. I'm you got three, three pictures here, but they're too small to see, so I'm going to blow up the left one. We'll look at A first. Okay, so here's A. Same article. Average, read what it says here in white. Average difference values for real ear output for manufacturers NAL2 compared to NAL2 on an audio scan verifit. Okay? So read it again. Average difference values for real ear output on manufacturers versions of NAL2 compared to NAL2 as it's found on real ear equipment. And there, now we're talking 55 dB inputs, so soft inputs again. That's why this 55 is highlighted and blown up, because B will show you 65, okay? And C will show you 75. But let's look at 55 first. So average different values for real ear output for manufacturers now to compared to now to on a real ear system. The zero line indicates or represents prescribed now two values. Points above the zero line indicate where the real ear output was more than now two, and points below the zero line indicate real ear outputs less than now two. Okay, so please try to realize what they're doing here. They're looking at what's how much are there? What are the differences? How much does the now two on, and you look at how many manufacturers you got, five. Hearing aid manufacturer one, two, three, four, and five. So they're showing you how much did those now twos differ from the now two on a real ear equipment. And look what they all did. They were all less 
Look at this, 5 dB less, 10 dB less, 5 dB less, 15 dB less. So it shows you that for soft inputs, manufacturers now too is quite a bit less than the now two that you're finding on the real ear equipment. Hmm, weird. Let's go to 65 dB inputs. That's B, panel B. And now what's what's happening? Well, sometimes the manufacturers are giving more than now two. Look at where my cursor is. But they're all giving less than the original now two in the highs. All of them. So look at the zero line where my cursor is. All five hearing aid manufacturers are prescribing less output with their now two than the now two asked for on the real ear equipment. Weird. Now look at 75. Many of the manufacturers are once again, at their now twos are asking for more output than the now two on the real ear equipment, but again, less in the highs. And it's all weird. It's all just strange. And that's why it's just once again, not only are the manufacturers proprietary methods asking for less output than most of the fitting methods. But secondly, when they use now two, they all use now two differently. <laughs> so I guess this is why I'm trying to say real ear cuts it. Real ear is what does it. Real ear is what shows what you really want. Okay. I'm going to take, go to the very first slide in this unit seven. PowerPoint. Now I'm going to go to the very first slide. Here we are. Software talks, real ear measurement walks. Here's three targets on the left. And outputs as predicted by software. Look at the three outputs. Those are the straight kind of bold face lines. And then the thin ones are showing what the hearing aid, what the software is saying. This is what the hearing aid is going to do to hit the targets. You've programmed the hearing loss into NOAA. We've taken that hearing loss and we've, you've chosen the method. Okay, now look at that. Yep, it, our, our, our software is fitting to the targets pretty good. Now look at the right. And the right is looking at the middle target right here. So look what's happening. If these plus signs are DSL-4, look at how far short of the target you are. Yet the software said you were right on it. It's a real trip. It's like DSL-4 child versus DSL-5, DSL-5 kid, DSL-5 adult versus now one. This would be the adult. This would be now one. This is the same slides we showed at the beginning of our talk today. Okay, Now two, now one, DSL-5. Okay, Now two versus DSL-5. Now two versus DSL-5. And then these are the, the stuff that we covered with under that article by Gus Mueller. So that's how far we have gone into unit seven today. What I want to do next week is show some of the differences in, in what we're getting when I had students at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. It's nice to have students because when you've got students, you have slaves that can do your work for you. So I had students <laughs> measure hearing aids all from all different companies and fit according to the software, and then we verified on real ear, and their assignment was to find out what the differences were, how big were the differences were, and that's what I'm going to cover and show you next week when we continue this Zoom session. Next week, I believe, is your last Zoom session for 250. Then we are done. Yeah, sehr gut. Yeah, any questions from either of you? Do you know if our finals proctored? I, oh boy. 
Lynn is always the best person to ask, was, was your, um, do you have labs in this course? Mm -hmm. My understanding yeah. is that if a course has labs, it's not proctored. Okay. That that's my sense. understanding of OTs. Is that right, Tina? Good. That's right. Yeah, yes. that's that's what I thought. I'm remembering this. So if you're if you have a, if the course does not have labs, like at 110 acoustics, right. their final is pro, is pro, is proctored. But I don't okay. think this one is. Great. So that's like shooting fish in a barrel. I like it. Easy peasy. <laughs> And so, and you had another question. It was about uh, about the, those quizzes, those darn things. Questions four and five. I have no idea why those are not popping up, but we won't worry too much about it. I'll email Lynn about it and and tell her what my suggestion is, and then we'll just kind of go from there. Okay. I think the other quizzes are open though. You can write quizzes seven and eight. We're we're basically all the way to the end here. So next week, all I'm going to do is cover a little bit more on those the differences between the software predictions and what you're getting with Real Ear. But otherwise, I think it's been a decent session today. I'm ready to go. I need a coffee. Man, besides, anyhow, so we're good. All right, you two conniving connivance. We'll see you next time. See you when we look at you. All right. All right. Bye bye. bye.